it struck, struck me that um, you know, my daughter, my goddaughter is 21, and I saw her last weekend, and, and I said, you know, what do what your 21-year-old friends want to do when they're all leaving university? And which companies would you like to work for? And a lot of them said Google. You know, and, and, and for us sitting here, Google, you're, the growth, it's a cool company. I mean, you have great offices. You feed us nice food. Um, you're doing amazing things. And so it struck me that it's extraordinary that you can't, that it's a difficult job to attract talent, the right talent, and manage them and, and, and make something of, of Google. So I'm really pleased you're going to talk about two things. One about what makes a Googler, because I think we're probably all quite interested in, in that. Um, and then secondly, some of the issues that you experience in perhaps why your job's not quite as easy as we thought it might be. I'm at Google, so I've got slides, uh, but I'm going <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> to flick through them quite quickly. Um, so it's interesting you say that, because um, a few years ago, you were asking everyone, who um, all these students, graduating students, where they wanted to work for, and they used to say Google, and now they say YouTube, uh, which is part of Google, as you know. Uh, but YouTube has become cooler, I think, than, than Google. So um, I still say, send me your CV. but. Uh, um, so, so yes, so my, my uh, job is uh, I deal with talent in HR at U Google UK. Uh, it's not as easy as you think, um, and we've got some uh, talent issues that I'd love to speak about. So I'd, I'd speak about what we've done to really create this um, um, culture of innovation which nurture and grow our talent uh, naturally, but also what we need to address um, in the future, because it's, it's, it's not easy anymore. It's competitive, um, and, um, and we reach the size of an organization where we have loads of talent, and we need to know what to do with them. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes. Um, so first of all, just so you know the size of the organization, it's 50,000 people, so 30,000 Googlers and 20,000 Motorola. Um, um, so it's w when we look at talent and we look at culture, uh, which makes our talent. It's we had a nice conversation just just prior to starting, where we say, you know, how do you keep that culture alive in all these um, over like 40 countries in the world? And that's that's a that's a big job, uh, but we think we're doing um, quite well on this front. So I'd love to share um, that with you. Um, and the secret is people. So what we've done since the beginning, when um, Larry and Sergei started about 16 years ago, they took time to hire people. And when they say they take time, I'm going to give you an example. I um, had 18 interviews, and that was eight years ago. Um, the um, Dan Kovli, who I hired myself, the uh, MD of uh, uh, UK now, uh, had 24. Uh, so we took time. And, um, and sometimes we lost people in the way, but uh, we thought if we hire the right people at the right place, at the right time, um, they will help us to grow our talent. So we can't make mistakes, especially when you hire the, at, the, at the senior level. Um, so our secret is people. Um, so I've got a cool job. Um, and that's, that's from the IPO letter from 2004 um, that, that Larry and Sergei um, wrote. And they say, and it still stands true uh, now, and it says, Google is not a conventional company and we do not intend to become one. Um, and we need to deal with Googlers differently and we, um, and we need to keep our culture alive. Um, and what makes a Googler is that really, when you ask every single one of these 50,000 people, there's uh, one thing that we all say, is that it's kind of cool to work at Google, but not because not because of the perk, perks, not because of the benefits, not because of the color of the offices and because we've got nice food. It's because we work on things that matters, that matter. And we really see on a daily basis what, how we influence lives of millions of people. And that's kind of cool uh, to be part of this. And that's inspirational. And um, I should, just coming back from our sales conference that we held in Vegas, uh, so 13,000 people, it's the first time they do this, about two weeks ago. And the, um, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't wow us like they used to do years ago with like innovative new products, new features, new things. They just reminded us of why we work there at Google and um, how, what, what kind of lives we, we changed this year. And we had like amazing 
non-famous people come on stage and say, you know, that's how we influence my life. Um, and that was just you know, amazing to, to see. Um, so that's Eric Schmidt. Um, and he said, since the beginning, um, he said, what makes Google is innovation. Innovation should be at the heart of everything. Um, and the story of innovation is, has, ne has never changed. It's always been a small team of people who have a new idea. And then you make sure that um, um, the executive around them um, understand the idea and support them. And that's what we were talking about a few minutes ago, where in general ideas at Google, whether it comes from the engineering department or the sales department or, or, or marketing department, always come from one crazy person who would have a crazy idea. And I can give you examples. Uh, and it sounds crazy, but they have the courage to speak up and say, that sounds like it's broadly aligned with what we want to do, which is make as much information available to as many people in the world. Are you behind me? And we give them time off to do this. We give them people, resources, and money. Um, and that's how crazy ideas um, happened. And that's basically what make our stand and st uh, stick. Because we know that every, at every level of the organization, if you have an idea, you have to speak up. And there's different channels that we give them, and I'll go through that in a, in a minute. Um, so one of the two latest big ideas, uh, but I can talk to you about the smaller things, is Google Glass. You must have heard of it. It's that crazy glass that you put. I mean, in the US, they have that everywhere. I find it so weird. Uh, but they, they, so they, they walk around with this, especially in New York, um, they walk around with glass. And basically, you can do whatever you want with this glass. So you speak and you say, glass, uh, take a picture. And glass, um, I want to go to... Brooklyn, uh, what's the fastest way? And it tells you exactly, it speaks to you, and, and you can, it's like a computer. It's quite amazing and disturbing at the same time when you speak to someone who's got a glass, because uh, you don't know if they blink, if they're taking a picture <laughs> of you. Um, but, um, but that's kind of cool. And, um, and the idea is to really make information as available to everyone at any given time. So it's not just a cool gadget. It's something that's going to touch millions of lives in Africa. As you know, Africa, they don't, they don't have computers, they don't have tablets, everything is done by mobile. And p the internet penetration is quite small, but it's about um, less than 30% um, in, in the developing countries. But if we manage to um, you know, give them glass, it would mean give them information and, and give them a way of communicating with each other all the time. Um, and that, that could be um, transforming their life, lives. Um, driverless car, so that's a car that drives by itself. It's crazy. It's something that was actually spoke to Larry and Sergey, UC plus Eric, 10 years ago. This crazy person at Stanford, I have to stop saying crazy, um, this professor at Stanford <laughs> um, came and talked to um, Larry and Sergey at one of their board of director meetings and said, you want a crazy idea? Well, I've got a crazy idea. I want to I wanna, um, I wanna build a car that will drive by itself. Everyone in the room laughed. But Larry, who said, hold on, what would you do this? And the person explained, the professor explained, and said, well, you know, that's, me, that's how many lives are killed on a, on a yearly basis due to road accidents. And that's how many people can't access anywhere in the world because they can't drive. And in the US, you know, you don't have a car. You can't go anywhere, almost. So, um, so Larry said, OK, well, I'm going to create this cell. It's called Google X. It's like the coolest department you can work at Google right now uh, because they work on these mental ideas. We call them 10x. So it's like, what were you going to do? You know, something you think about something that is not even thinkable now, you multiply by 10 and this is where we're going to get to. And that, um, and finally, the car has been um, um, constructed and is available. It's kind of a prototype still, but um, it's run um, in California. And, and rather, the state of California has, has um, made them kind of legal. So um, you'll see more of those very soon. Um, and to go back about talent, uh, good people, uh, that, that's the when, when you hire people at Google, you have to think about one thing, is that good people know good people. So if you're in Google, you must know good people you want to work with. And don't worry about the level of seniority. Don't worry about their, um, the fact that they might be smarter than you. Actually, always hire smarter than you. Always hire people that you can learn from. Don't be scared, because if you have ideas and you've got skills and the will, 
then you'll find a job for you for yourself. Uh, but hire people. And I was at the beginning it was actually outstanding to see that people were actually hiring their own bosses. Um, it was kind of cool to see. So if you give, if you hire the right people, uh, if you give them space for innovation, if you if you maintain the culture of innovation, that will give, bring you even more talent. Um, and how do you maintain this culture of innovation? Is kind of um, um, part of my job. Um, so you hire the right people. That's what I was talking about. Um, and you hire people who are generalists, people that you think, hold on, they might not be exact the, the exact fit that I have for this job description right now, but they could be amazing for the future. And that's the people we want. We don't hire for for needs that we have now, but for needs that we think we might have in the future. So most of the people I've hired, and I used to um, be the recruiter for marketing team in EMEA, I've hired a brain surgeon, people who worked at the NASA, um, someone who worked in charity work, opened a school in Africa. I've hired um, a translator I was telling you about. And all these people are, actually three of those are, are working at Google X, this cool cell, like department that we have. So really hire journalists who have a strong bias for actions and who are owners. People will be able to see an issue, see a problem, see a challenge, an opportunity, make their own and, and go with it. Then you give them the raw material. And the raw material is everything from space, actually space to talk, get feedback from people they, they, they work with. Um, so at Google, every, we don't have a lot of offices, uh, closed offices. Everything is, everything is done in open offices. Everything is done so the department can swap uh, um, seats and talk to each other. And so that's the first thing. We um, give them time, so 20% of your time you can spend if you want to innovate. You can spend this time um, on innovation. And um, we give them access. So we, we have this rotation program you were talking about and we swap people from one department to another so they learn and share best practices, ideas, etc. Because that we, that's where we, you're going to raise a flag. Yes. Oh, that means I've got a few minutes left. Um, then you create only as much structure as necessary. And we're actually looking at the everything is done with data. My job is done with data. Um, and we're actually looking at data right now that um, would, and we're thinking very, very big here. We're actually thinking, do we really need managers at Google? We've got these all layers of management. Do we actually need them? Um, does it prevent from, from innovation from happening? And th that, that's how we think. So we want um, as a small layer as we can. Um, so right now, for example, my reporting line to Larry is six people. Um, and that's the, maxim that's the maximum you can have, six to eight people to, the, to, to Larry. And then uh, make managers resources, not bosses. So they shouldn't be people who prevent you from doing things. They should be people who say yes and who support you and would not dictate, but actually embrace your ideas and, and support you and give you the right um, support and, and um, at, the ma at their management level. And then we give a lot of tools for people to say if they're happy, not happy, if they've got ideas, and that's all of that. Uh, but we've got this kind of happiness survey where people are very open about what, um, what's working, what's not working. Um, we could write to Larry any response. Uh, we've got this bureaucracy buster kind of um, uh, sessions where we put everyone in a room and say, what's not working, and then we fix it. Everything at Google changes from one day to another, and you just have to hire people that can adapt easily. Because if you can't adapt easily, and if you're not versatile, then that's, that's a difficult pressure to, to adapt to. Um, and then we reward them. So once you get base pay out of the way, because we know that we pay our employees fair, uh, fairly, according to market reference points that we have, we pay for performance. So we've got data to, ass uh, to, to assess performance, and we pay and reward people for performance. And then we give them stock in the company. And so every year we review the number of stocks that people have, shares, and we give them more uh, to people that we think have an impact on the company. Because if they're attached to what the company stands for and does, you, you make them feel more involved. And that's important for us. Um, we reward uh, risk-taking. And we never, ever tell people off for failing. That's one thing that we don't do. If you fail, if you've done everything and you failed, well, that's OK. Someone else will help you and make it a success. 
and it's like product. We launch like three or four products on a daily basis that you don't see, and we take them out because it's not working. And we call it beta testing. We, we test it with people, it's not working, we take it back, launch it six months later with a better version, and that's, that's what we do with Android phone, etc. And we let people try out. And that's the next question that you must have, which, which, which is how do you keep talent? Um, and it's very hard at the moment because you've got other companies that are basically made, half of them are made of ex-Googlers. So take Facebook, take Twitter, take Square, Crete was not far, all of them are like, it's about 2,500, 5,000 company uh, employees globally and they're all made of half of Googlers. So all of the tricks I gave you, they have them. And they've got the network and, they, and they're friends. And, um, and it's easy for them to build their teams. And I'm, part of my job as well is to really understand out of all these amazing 50,000 people that we have, who are the top talent that we actually have to retain. It's difficult. Um, but we have to be even more selective now and nurture the top talent that we have. Um, and, and be ready to lose people. And be ready to welcome them back as well. Because some people, especially in the US, if some people try out a new, a new thing and then they knock at the door and, and it's okay, we're friends and we, wel we welcome them back. Um, so sorry, Carol Caroline. So if you have, if you interview people 18 times, what, uh, what do people ask them <laughs> if you've got 18 different people interviewing So hold on, that's not true anymore. I would have to say, now it's four. So we had a, um, a people analytics team who did an amazing job looking at trends of interview data and, and, and where is the decision basically made, at what stage of the interview process the, the, interview is based, the, the decision is basically made. And, as and we discovered it was the fourth interviewers. If four, interviews, four interviewers are aligned, then it's fine, we can take the risk, and it's quite low. All the rest is just because we didn't want to take the risk. Um, but you wouldn't imagine. I mean, we ask everything, stupid question that you might have heard. I shouldn't say it on, they're recording me. Um, <laughs> um, very, very um, non-interesting question, like, you know, calculate the number of, of heirs that the dog has, just to see how they, people think. <laughs> Does it really matter? No. Uh, so we kind of ask this kind of question, and we test different things. We test their general ability, to do the job, um, their um, smarts, and that's the type of question that we ask. We put them in a, as a case study and see how they interact. We test the leadership at whatever level of the organization they, they, they enter, uh, because you can always understand what kind of leader you are about to hire, even with people that have, have not never done any leadership roles, but you know things they've done at university, etc., and hobbies and googliness. And the googliness part is basically, could you spend 24 hours stuck in an airport with that person and still have something mm. to say to each other 24 hours <laughs> later? <laughs> that's basically the question we ask ourselves. And you say, and if you test these four areas and everyone agrees that you know, it's a match, Great. then Thank that's you. fine. Thank you, Caroline. That's yes. really good.